Growing a business is hard, but it does not have to be. Once a week, we take a break from the hustle and bustle in business to talk about innovations and what's new in the C-suite. This is the Fractional C-Suite Retreat, and I'm Joseph Frost. Pull up a seat at the fire, grab a drink, smoke a cigar, and just join me as we relax, learn, and get inspired. This retreat is sponsored by Your CMO, helping organizations grow with better marketing strategy. Welcome. I'm excited to have today's guest. She is someone who has started her business to solve a huge marketing problem, creating real connections. She's a revolutionary marketer who has the ability to revamp a company's content strategy. As a content concierge, she helps brands along all steps of the process from strategy to execution. She is co-founder of Content Bacon. Welcome, Wendy Lieber. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Joseph. All right. Yeah, I have a standard question, but before we answer that, I, I want to know why bacon? How did you come up with content bacon? Well, come on. Everyone loves bacon, right? That's what I think. If you don't like bacon, you're wrong. And so it's just an easy way for me to filter out people that I don't want to do business with. But um, <laughs> no, seriously, bacon makes everything better. Our content makes everything better. So it was just the perfect combination of two words that tell a good micro story. Yeah, I, I've loved that name. It sticks with you too. It, everybody sees it, remembers it, and is intrigued by it. So, um, well, great. Well, um, the, lo- the question I'd like to start with, with each guest is, um, what is something that uh, you think all, uh, anyone in the C-suite should be thinking about these days? What's going on in the world where you think we should bring some attention to uh, in the C-suite? Telling your story in a way that is compelling to all your different audiences is something that sometimes as you get higher up in a company, you might get removed from that. And I think it's really important to be asking the question, you know, what are we doing to attract you know, new audience members? What are we doing to engage? What are we doing with our current customers, past customers? What are we doing with our referral sources? So I think just being really interested in what's going on and what's being communicated, because again, I I believe every company has a compelling story to tell. Most are doing a rather poor job or maybe not doing it at all. And so that would be part one. And then it, it would probably be, I'd be remiss not to mention, you know, AI is everywhere today. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone thinks it's going to replace everyone. And um, be interested, be curious, be engaged, but don't be distracted. Don't let it distract you from your core business, connecting as a human being, like be, be an advocate, be a stand that AI is here to serve us, not us serve AI. And so that would probably be like, I, I think just all around, we should all really embrace that and and really be interested in that conversation. Yeah, AI, we can definitely touch on that today because it is the hot topic. Um, but I want to dig deeper into your thoughts on on telling your story. And you know, at the C-suite level, a lot of times, um, you know, there, there's clarity and in, in, in vision and mission there, but it doesn't get disseminated always well to the rest of the organization. Um, from a marketing perspective, there's pretty clear clear messaging that we want to deliver from the C-suite that doesn't actually get to our audiences. So how do you go from strategy to execution? Um, what are some of the steps or, or things that C-suite members should be thinking about? Actually doing it, having a strategy, having a plan that you're involved with, determining how you want to communicate with your audience, making sure that you're adding value, solving problems, educating that, and, and those things are, are, are clear to the rest of your organization, I think is super important. I think a lot of times in the C-suite, we can become very focused on, you know, ROI, right? And ROI is super important and we all know that, but your message, your story, creating relationships is is what creates that ROI. And in order to do that, you actually have to, you know, be interested in, you know, how do we communicate that? What are we communicating? And be be willing to invest in that 
so that you can build those relationships and that you can get that ROI. So I, I think the steps to doing it, you know, not to be overly simplistic are just to do it, you know, have a plan, be interested, be involved. So often the way a leader can, can share a vision can be so inspiring and, you know, being able to use that as the foundation for additional content, whether it's, you know, to generate awareness, generate interest, you know, keep your current customers aware of what's going on. Like so, so often there's so many exciting things happening at the company level, but we're all so busy doing, doing, doing that we don't stop to share. And that's, that's where often the, the magic can be. How much do you get involved with uh, plans for internal audience communication and content versus external marketing audience communication? That to me is, is super important. It became more important as teams became more and more remote where companies that, you know, were used to being able to hold informal company meetings or you know, just walk from office to office where all of a sudden they didn't have that at their fingertips. And so having kind of more structured internal communication became more important. So we do a lot there from a couple of different perspectives. Um, one, making sure that kind of your hiring materials, your culture, that that's, there's a way for potential employees to get a glimpse of that. Cause again, often that's hidden, right? It's like, you don't know it until you're part of the inner circle and in this competitive marketplace, being able to communicate that so that you are, you know, differentiated from maybe others in your field, but then also having kind of like regular cadences with your team, if you are now spread out and remote is super important. It could be as simple as a weekly, you know, maybe version of a podcast or, you know, we're, we're very big on Slack in our organization and have different channels, but Often when I am involved on those channels, you know, I get a lot of feedback from my team, how valuable it is. And it just is a, it's this constant reminder of just how important it is to have those touch points for your, you know, internal as well as external team. Yeah, for sure. So when you think of content uh, from a marketing perspective, externally, what all do you get involved with? Do you go uh, not just creating the content and copy, but you get into what are the right tools to use to to share and what are the right networks to be on and um, what should be lead gen content versus branding and awareness content. Is that stuff that you work on as part of your strategy with, with folks? Yeah. I mean, our best customers come to us typically with their marketing strategy somewhat planned out. And then we, we really support the marketing strategy plan with, with a content strategy or plan. And all of those things you mentioned are part of that. And, and we refer to it as, you know, the flywheel. So we look at, you know, what are you doing to generate more awareness, attract more strangers? And, the, and there's obviously different types of content that support that in different channels to get that content out. So that could be more organic, you know, your own website, your blog articles, your social media, then there's, what are you doing to engage with your audience? So like, let's say you're getting lots of traffic to your website, but no one's doing anything. It's like, well, is there something for them to do? Like a lot of times companies, websites can often be just like brochureware and there's not really a way to engage. And that's so important today that your, your, you know, your website is a place where people can come, come back to and do something. So, you know, we work with companies to figure out what those things might be at different stages, because not everyone's always ready to book a call, right? It's not all about you know that sometimes they just want to opt into a listen to a podcast or a newsletter. So creating that and then, you know, what's going on with your CRM, I I, I love working with companies that have like just a, a gold mine in their, in their database, but they've just not done anything with. Um, it's like one of those assets that's there. And so that's something, you know, we work on is figuring out how to use what you already have to, to create some gold. And then, you know, again, so often companies completely ignore their current customers, <laughs> you know, like you get a customer and then you stop telling them what, like you're, you may be doing what you need to do to support whatever they're, they're working on with you, but you forget to communicate the new things you're doing or the additional things that you could do for them that maybe they weren't ready 
to do when they first came on board with you. So that constant customer communication, I think is also just so important for retention and growth. So we help strategize all of that or parts of that because not every company is ready for all of those things at once. But over time, our hope is that we can get that flywheel spinning and you're just in, in momentum mode. Now, once did I hear you say SEO? So how, how important is those um, kind of technical SEO components in creating the right content uh, for external audiences? I think it's really important. I mean, we always say we write for humans first, search engine second, um, which is our belief because, you know, if someone does land on your content because they found it through keyword search and it's, you know, pardon my French, shitty content, it's not going to do any, any good for you, but we certainly use an SEO approach to determining what are the right topics to be talking about. We structure it. Um, When you're, when you're working with an SEO company, you know, content is usually one of the key pieces of an overall SEO strategy. So that's where we come in, but we're, we are not an SEO company and we don't do the backlinking strategy. There's a host of things we don't do. We do the the content piece to ensure that the things that your audience might be looking for, or, you know, you've got the appropriate content for, I think a great first step for companies that are like, you know, I'm not really doing much in this. Where do I start? I want to do this on my own is I love the, the frequently asked questions, just coming up with all the things your, your prospects or your customers are asking you, or you wish they would ask you. That is a very effective way to create a great content strategy and just start writing content around that. Because if someone's asking you, they're, they're typing it into I used to say they're typing it into Google. They're typing it into Google Chat GPT now. Um, so you know, having having the answers on your digital platforms is is really important. And it's just a great way to also just stay sharp and like what what are our our you know our customers asking us? What are our prospects asking us? What do we wish they would ask us? And that's another thing about content that I love is like the more you do it. It's like the better as a company, it makes you because, you know, communicating is not easy. Communicating effectively is even harder. And so having like a really strong process internally, like how do we talk about things? How do we do it in a clear, concise manner? How do we take complicated things and make them simple? You know, how do we make things entertaining? Like those are not all easy things to to do, but the more you do them, the better, I think, internally and externally, you're able to articulate things. Yeah, for sure. Um, I like how you said, all right, we write for humans first, SEO second. But I'm curious with AI and chat GPT, when does that start to play into your writing? Um, I know I'm digging deep with a with an, another uh, person. We both know Ab Deweese from, yeah. from EO and and we actually started a, a bit of a consultancy called sevenways.ai. And it's, it's, it's at the tipping point of trying to understand how you get found when people search you or something that you want to be found for on ChatGPT. And we're discovering what worked for SEO doesn't work for the AI. It, 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 it's actually much more of the human element that they're trying to discover. So the fact that you're already writing for humans first I think puts your content um, above others that have been writing first and foremost for SEO because keywords aren't being searched. Right. Uh, meta tags aren't being searched. Um, it's doing right now. It's doing a light search of the web, usually bringing one or two topics back and they want to, under- and it, it wants to understand what that stuff means based on the context of your prompt. So there's a big mystery of how the algorithm is going to end up playing out for people writing content for AI in the future. What have you discovered or been thinking about? I mean, definitely been thinking about it. I don't have any answers. I've seen some of the stuff that, that you and Abe have been doing. I'm fascinated by it. I, I definitely think it's, you know, it's all disruptive. And I think it's 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 going to have a lot of great things that come out of it. It's going to have some things that aren't great. And, you know, we're at the end of the day, you know, our mission is, you know, we want to, we want to help our customers tell stories that resonate with their target audience and that connect with their target audience to get them to, you know, take the actions they want them to take. And so 
obviously AI is going to play a role in that. I don't know exactly to what extent, um, you know, I I've said before and, and like in some ways, I don't care how the content gets created. I just want to make sure it's effective at, you know, connecting and helping move things forward. I guess my personal preference is I think when a human's involved, when there's a personal connection, when the heart is involved, it's better. Um, but I'm also, you know, at this point right now where I'm like, you know, I just want to be open so that I, I can just make sure that, you know, I'm guiding our company correctly and I'm, I'm guiding our customers correctly. So I feel like we're just in, in a new territory where, you know, I don't, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. (laughs) Questions though. Yeah. It's a discovery process for sure. I think when people are, uh, think about SEO and, and, um, AI today, the, where their mind goes first is, oh, I can use AI to create all my content. Right. I can use I can use ChatGPT to build all my content, and therefore my SEO will be better. And I don't necessarily believe that to be true or not true. I know Google says, and we don't care how it's created either, as long as it's compelling and and right. you know, the reader enjoys it and does something with it. Um, you know, we're looking at it from the other side, which is when someone does search through ChatGPT, how do you make sure your content is getting delivered to that search? And and there's a difference there. Um, And whether it's written by human or written by AI, I don't think that answers that question. Um, That's what we're trying to discover. I do know that um, the reason we named sevenways.ai, the reason we named it seven ways is that we asked chat GPT, you know, how best to communicate with it. And they gave us six ways. And we figured the seventh way was the human element. And I think that's the key. It's, it's still, the humans are going to be the ones figuring out all of this. You're, you're not going to be able to ask chat GPT how to optimize my site for being found by you and get an accurate answer. It's still coming down to humans that are figuring this stuff out. Yeah. I mean, I like to think that, you know, what's going to be most useful is going to win. And then it's like, okay, well then what creates the most useful content? And again, I think that it's, it's chat GPT is a great way to jumpstart a lot of that. It makes a lot of things easier. I think a lot of CEOs or people that maybe haven't been involved in the intricacies of content before go to chat GPT and it can do something for them very quickly and they get kind of mesmerized by that and they think it's good when it really may not be or may not be effective. So I think we're still in a little bit of that like shiny object syndrome right now where so many people are just like, you know, experimenting and mesmerized by it. But, you know, we've yet to see kind of, you know, what's coming out the other end and how all all this new content that's being created so easily is actually you know, providing value, you know, or is it just providing more noise? And yeah, it's, it's a interesting time. So are there some AI tools that your team is using and effectively that that you, you can share? Yeah. I mean, we're using a lot of tools. Um, We've been using Jasper, um, you know, for a couple of years now. Um, We've been using some SEO tools. I think we use a a whole host of them. Um, obviously we use chat GPT. Um, we've been, you know, playing around with a lot of the AI PRMs, you know, the different prompts, like creating some of our own, there's probably a lot, a lot more that they're using and experimenting with. I mean, it's like the amount of stuff coming out, you know, every day, you know, we're just like, we're also using tools for our own operations side of the business. Right. So there's like what we do as a company, which is, you know, creating compelling content, but we're also a company, right. That's doing a lot of things like hiring. And, you know, so, you know, our team this week did some demo of something. I I don't remember. We just had our, our, um, our leadership meeting earlier this morning and they were, they were super excited about it. And we're actually looking at building some stuff. So there, there's a lot going on. You know, I think the way I'm looking at it is, you know, are there ways we can be more effective, more efficient, you know, faster, better, cheaper um, as an organization, which of course there are. And then I think that goes hand in hand with are, are there tools that help us produce better, more compelling, more sticky content? And so 
you know, we're looking at it from, from both perspectives to just, again, just make sure that as a company, we're providing the most value to our customer base. There's a lot of tools out there and the new ones every day. It's, it's hard to keep up. Good to hear you've got a few core ones that you've been using for a while. Jasper's one I've seen a lot of people been using for more than the last you know, six months. Yeah. Um, ChatGPT is the one everybody gets excited about. Um, but uh, the other question I have for you, so we have a fractional CMO firm uh, at your CMO. We've got 25 different uh, fractional CMOs on the team right now. And a big thing for us is, is utilizing buyer interviews um, and market research, but more customer, you know, customer interviews to generate those key insights that we think um, should then drive the messaging and content towards. So from those insights, we're, under, we're un- uncovering um, what pain points are really there in their own words and uh, what they're really looking for in a product or service, uh, what the decision criteria really is, as opposed to a lot of times it gets done in a boardroom where you, uh, you ask the owners or the marketing team or the salespeople what they think. And it's there's a lot of correlation there, but when you hear it from the voice of the customer or from the interviews with customers, um, you're more spot on. And then that drives the, the copy and the messaging. What kind of research do you do to support the messaging that you're um, building for your customers? I'm curious. One of the things I'm so proud of with our company is our processes and systems. Um, We really have amazing processes and systems and our onboarding process is one of those. So when we onboard a new customer, you know, we have a questionnaire, which is, you know, always evolving and changing. So, you know, part of it is, is input that our customer gives us, um, certainly during the sales process, some of that information is getting captured and carried forward. But so some is, you know, customer supplied, um, certainly competitor information, industry information. So there's, you know, there's all of that, but then we also are very much in line with, with what, you know, you just spoke about, you know, doing subject matter expert interviews, you know, really hearing from the voice of, of the customer um, and, you know, factoring that in. So it's really not one thing. It's a host of different things, which also goes to, you know, what are the goals? Because, making sure we understand the goals of the company, who they're trying to reach, learning about that, you know, audience, what's important to them. Because again, sometimes the customer thinks something is so important from their perspective when their buyer, you know, isn't interested in that. They're interested in, you know, something else. And so trying to to bridge the gap there. So we spend a lot of time in, you know, research, you know, evaluating what we do against, you know, the goals. But always the best research we get is when we can connect with the customer or, or their, you know, their customers and, and hear from them what's important, you know, what problems they solve, what pain points they solve, and, and use that as, you know, some of the, the foundational content to, to build on. Yeah, that's good. Um, so how did you start this business, Wendy? Yeah, so I was in the um, EO Accelerator program at the time with a different company called Athena Marketing. I was doing just kind of more high-level strategic marketing um, consulting, if you will, and had a nice-sized business, doing well, but it, it wasn't the game I wanted to play. It was very much dependent on me. I didn't have good processes and systems, so even you know trying to hire people was was challenging because it was all kind of in my head. You know, I, I did it. Um, always, you know, new approach every single time, all the things you shouldn't do, you know, when yeah. you're, you're building a business, um, you know, I made it very dependent on me, which at the time was my goal. Like I want every client to feel like they can call me at three o'clock in the morning. And it's like, you know, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yeah. So when I was in the accelerator program, which for your audience is a program designed to, to scale businesses, to get above a million dollars, I really became clear that, Athena Marketing was not the company I wanted to grow and scale. And I really started to to see how companies were struggling with their content creation and how important it was, you know, becoming and was going to continue to become. So 
I started dabbling with subscriptions with like my current client base, just to see how they, you know, were received and, you know, what, what impact it had. And it was like super simple, like all, you know, all or most of my clients were super interested, willing to, you know, give me a credit card, just charge them every month. Didn't have to have those, you know, heavy lift ROI conversations every month. It was more like they slept better knowing that, Hey, at least my blog, my social media, my newsletter is happening consistently. And so that was kind of like the impetus for the idea. And then I met my partner in Accelerator who had a branding company, was kind of going through the same thing, didn't really want to grow and scale that business, um, was doing some interesting things on the content side with videos, um, whiteboard videos at the time. So long story short, we combined forces, you know, gave birth to Content Bacon while we were in the Accelerator program together. And then within a year, you know, was able to grow that company um, and, you know, graduate and to EO. We, we wore dual hats for a while. Like we were doing content bacon. He was continuing his company. I was continuing mine. And then we just had an aha moment one day. I remember I was like walking around in New Jersey and I was like, enough, like, I want to do this full time. I want to go all in. This is where it's at. And, um, so yeah, I just, you know, 100% put all my effort and, and him too and content bacon. And here we are. That's awesome. Um, so I mean, this is me just going to ask you some nerd entrepreneur questions. Yeah, yeah I love it. <laughs> Cause I love those stories. So how do you, um, how do you have your team? Is it all employees? Do you, in the marketing space, a lot of times it's freelancers or it's a combination. So it is a combination. Um, there are a couple of key things. So when we started, you know, we thought we were going to have this office, you know, full of creatives. I like envisioned this like Saturday night live writing room where I peek my head in every once in a while and just creativity off the charts. So we realized early on that, you know, to hire the best talent geography, you know, shouldn't be an issue. So, you know, we were a virtual remote company before the, the pandemic, um, but we're a combination. So our leadership team, which is, you know, I am the CEO. I have a, a an integrator or I refer to her as my chief of staff. We have a chief of content, um, chief of production, HR, um, and you know, VP of marketing. So that's, you know, kind of our core team. We have um, editors and our account managers, we refer to them as strategists. So they're all part of our full-time team. And then, yeah, we do have 50, 60 freelancers at any given time that work underneath us because we work on so many different industries and even within industries, different levels of expertise. So our ability to build the right teams based on, you know, our, our customer is super important, but we do have a, a pretty core freelance team that's been working with us a while, but we're always adding to that. And if anyone's ever worked with writers or creatives, um, especially in the freelance, it's, you know, they can be amazing and consistent and then poof, all of a sudden they're, (laughs) they're gone. So having like a freelance team where like our editing team, our strategy team is more fixed really helps with any disruption. So we've learned that there's really no single point of failure um, where, again, a lot of companies that have maybe worked directly with a writer or a writing team, they've experienced the pain of like, oh, yeah, and then they're like, you know, they're gone. And, you know, it's it's such a headache to try to rebuild that. So we've kind of developed some ways to to um, minimize the, the risk of that. That's great. How do you differentiate between your chief of content and your chief of production? I was curious. Yeah. So chief of content is really like responsible for the actual product. So all the writers and editors are underneath um, her. And then our chief of production is really more like traffic deadlines, you know, making sure that all everything's running within budget and within timelines. Um, so they, they work hand in hand, yeah. but that's the, that's the distinction. Okay. That makes sense. Good. I'm glad it makes sense. <laughs> so I'm saying, um, is this going to make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, it makes great sense. I am somebody I ran and, uh, you know, I have a video production company that's done some creative and I completely get it. The, the skittiness <laughs> of, of freelancers is real. Um, 
And I tell people all the time, it's really hard to hire anybody who's part-time remote or actually it doesn't matter if it's remote. Part-time is just the hardest thing to hire for because it's inconsistent. You know, they, they, they're part-time for a reason and many of those reasons mean they won't be here in six months. So yeah. um, having that, those layers that protect the end user to cut your customer from that pain, yeah. uh, super smart, uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, we're constantly looking at our structure, you know, like our, you know, accountability chart and structure. I mean, it's something that we're always looking at to make sure that it does make the most sense and is, you know, providing the most, most value for our customers. And we've definitely pivoted a few times and, you know, or tried some things that didn't work. So it's, it's always up for discussion. Um, But this model has been in, in place for, you know, a while and it seems to be working really well. So who ends up being the AI champion in your organization? That's the, that's the question we have in our own, like who should own AI? I have a couple of different thoughts. I mean, I think as the, the CEO visionary, I have to own it in terms of, you know, how do we view it? What's our view on it? And, and what's our investment around it? Like, what are we going to actually do? So I feel like I own it from that perspective. Um, really everyone a little bit is, is owning it from their respective area. But my, my key partner in this right now is my chief of content, you know, where she and I are constantly evaluating new tools. I'll send things to her. She'll evaluate it. Let me know. So she and I um, are, are really the, the key owners, but I mean, you know, it, it does, you know, I guess keep me up a little bit at night. I mean, not much really keeps me up, but but right now, and maybe it's, it keeps me up more from like excitement, creativity, if there is a, another way, a better way um, to be approaching this, because, you know, it is, I think it probably warrants more attention than it gets right now. Um, and again, we're running a business, you know, mm-hmm. and so I think, you know, having that, that time for deep dive on just innovation in general, not necessarily AI, but anything I think is always like a fine balance because, you know, it's, it's just important. You know, I I don't want to be the blockbuster on the, on the block, you know, seeing, seeing Netflix eat our lunch. (laughs) Well, especially with content, because I think that's the easiest thing that people think AI can replace. Oh, I don't need a copywriter anymore. I mean, that's, I've heard that so many times. I don't believe it, but I've heard it. And that's, um, I think what people will discover is, they still need the human, no matter how much of the final content's getting created by AI, that there's got to be a human that runs it. And so yeah. as a content production company, um, you've got the humans and you can, you know, I, I would imagine you can do, you're a lot more efficient and productive with the AI tools than yeah. anybody who's never written content before is. Like that's, that's the thing, like it's going to take somebody else twice as much time to get the right content out of AI than, than you would be able to do getting out of AI. hundred percent. Yeah. Cause it, it's, it starts with, you know, what, what is the strategy? Like, what, what are you going to write about? What do you, you know? And, and it's also like being creative and innovative and a lot of the content that we do comes, you know, from proprietary information and not proprietary, like it can't go out there, but it's just like in, in order to get at it, you have to ask the right questions. AI is not going to be able to tell, tell you that right away. So, you know, one of, one of the things we say is, you know, like being able to share your story in a way that others won't is really important. And, you know, cause a lot of businesses are, you know, might feel like commodity type businesses, right? So how do you create content that's not just, um, you know, same old stuff that's out there? And because like the, the, the world doesn't need more of that. But again, it takes something to create that. And that's not AI generated today. Well, it's AI actual intelligence generated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> intelligence. I like that. <laughs> so one of the things you said earlier was that you're pretty much an, uh, a remote uh, organization, virtual, we are too. Uh, that's one of the things I'm, I'm very curious about are um, ways that companies are successfully uh, leading uh, those remote workers and, and creating a culture that is um, you know, distributed remotely. It's, it's a hard thing to do. It's 
well, it's, it's maybe it's hard is the wrong word. It's much different than the traditional way of building uh, inside of four walls. Uh, so what are some of the things that you do to kind of um, uh, support that, that strong culture and team building and development uh, through this remote workforce that you have? Yeah, I think some of the core things, um, the basics are, you know, we do a daily huddle. Um, I think that has been so important. You know, we we have our, our, our meeting rhythms. And so I think the consistency in those is really so important. And, and you know, the, the daily huddle is really, you know, a place where we connect and align. And I think that we've been doing that for, I, I can't tell you how many, many years, but that's been one of the most important things is just the, the overall meeting rhythms. And, um, and then again, I mentioned we use Slack so that, you know, it just feels like you've always got the team at your fingertips. You know, um, we've got some fun channels on our Slack, so it's not just all business. There's, there's, you know, uh, where sh people share funny things. So, but I think really having a very strong purpose and being able to articulate that um, to the team and then we just, you know, it's just kind of reiterated. It's it's really just the basics, the, the meeting rhythms, knowing who you are, who you target, just pounding that in day in, day out um, is what creates that. And, and, you know, accountability, right? It's like, you know, holding people accountable, rewarding people when they're, you know, when they're, they're winning, but also like being willing to have the hard discussions when it's not working, um, I guess I don't know that I have the, 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 the secret answer, but those are the things that I feel like have worked, have worked well for us thus far, but it, it's, it's always, again, something on our, our mind because, you know, I mean, it's like, if we didn't have to, to worry about employees or customers, business would be easy, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> But having the the right fit team members, you know, is is so in, important. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely one of one of the the, the biggest challenges. Is you know, as we grow, you know, being able to you know bring those people in fast enough, onboard them fast enough, you know, it's 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 part of the, I guess, the privilege of being an entrepreneur, having to deal with all those things. Yeah. Um... Is so most of your uh, workforce U.S. based, or have you ventured into some outsourcing to nearshore or offshore? Yeah, all of the above. The bulk is U.S. based. We've also done some some nearshore talent out of Mexico. We've got a couple um, team members out of the the Philippines, um, and we've done really all of those relationships through other companies, and so versus direct, and um, which I feel like helps because you know then we're we're really working with with a partner who's helping us you know bring in the, the right talent so we, you know we are our, our, I will say our our writing editing talent um well that's not true anymore it used to be fully U.S. based but we have found like some amazing like technical writers and in, in other locations so we've kind of opened that up we used to be a little bit more picky about that because I think there was um perception that you know like if you found like really inexpensive content it was usually because they were you know getting writers out of these other countries that weren't you know english speaking was not their their native language but again we we've we've found some pretty amazing talent in other countries now so we're open to all but the the bulk of our team is still us based yeah. sounds a lot like us you know at the, at the cmo business why uh <clears throat> all of our cmos are us based but we have support team members uh, that are highly talented uh, yeah. in both Mexico and the Philippines. Um, and I, I actually, with two other EOers, we started our own business in the Philippines um, mm -hmm. to supply talent to other people because um, we, between the three of us, we had, we had a, enough talent to make it make sense. And there is value in having that third partner, that, that partner that you have, uh, at least from our perspective, uh, our company, the Philippines, is is providing kind of an additional layer of accountability and culture and teamwork that we also provide. It's like a double um, yeah. a double source for those employees to have. They feel like they're part of the third party and that they're part of your company too. And, and that's a that's a really nice benefit. And then we have an EOer that we use um, to find 
people in Mexico and uh, they're great to work with as well. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of out, outshore, uh, you know, whether it's offshore or nearshore outsourcing makes a ton of tent sense right now for companies. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. It's, it's, it's fun too, to have, you know, different time zones, different cultures. It's, oh gosh. It's, yeah. It's really great. Yeah. I actually that, traveled to the Philippines to meet, you know, some of our team last, last November, which was really great. Oh, well, if you go again, let me know. I, will. I, I get over there two or three times a year. Yeah. So what do you like to do for fun, Wendy, when you're not working? I love to work out. Um, my new obsession is I love doing infrared sauna and cold plunge. It's um, become like an, an obsession. Like I'm going four or five times a week. So I love just doing anything that makes me feel good, feel healthy. Um, I love movies. I love I love cooking. I love, you know, like good food. I love travel. I'm just getting ready to go on a, a trip with my family. Um, we're taking a cruise out of Southampton, England to Ireland, Iceland, and Scotland. So super excited about that. And of course I love, I was in Cape town recently for the global leadership conference. So, but yeah, I just love hanging out with friends, meaty conversations, sizzling conversations. That's awesome. I missed you in Cape town. Um, and I love travel too. That's one of my, yeah. I, love. I, I saw that there's an Indiana Jones five movie out. Did you see that? <laughs> I did see that. <laughs> I can't believe, I mean, who's in it? Who, who, who could possibly be starring in it with any action roles? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll probably go see it though. It's been, that's, that's one of those that'd be fun to watch. Now. Well, it's, it's July 4th weekend, right? So they always like to come out with this kind of movies. I think in July 4th weekend, cause people like to try to go to the movies, you know, f- family kind of movies. So. Yeah. Yeah. Your trip sounds uh, fantastic on the boat. Is it yeah. like a big cruise ship or is it a small It is. Ship or, it's uh, a, it's a, I guess it's, I think it holds like 2,500 people. I'm not a big cruise person. So being 11 days on a cruise, I'm like, eh, but it's because it's like my, my whole family, my parents, sisters, you know, like it's, it, I think it makes sense for those type of trips. So yeah, I'll, I'll have to, I'll, I'll let you know if I survive on the other end. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it sounds amazing. We are doing a, uh, uh, some kind of a, not all EO group, but a, a probably at least 60% EO couples are going to do a boat um, trip. And it's, I think it fits 30, three people. So 15 couples and it's in Croatia. Oh so yeah. We go up and down the Croatia. I know plenty of people have done that, that like recently when I'm, yeah, that's that I hear it's amazing. That's going to be fantastic. Yeah, it's next summer. So we're really looking forward to that one. That should be. Oh, yeah, that will be incredible. Yeah, no, I I think they started that maybe last summer and they, but yeah, I I know quite a few people who've done that. Um, I, it was definitely on my list. I just couldn't fit it all in, but yeah, that's going to be fantastic. Yeah, there's so many, so many things to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. My wife's a school teacher. And so summers are the times we get to travel together. The rest of the time I'm usually traveling and she's teaching class, but uh uh, we're going to try to see if we can go a little early and do something and stay a little late and maybe bring our rest of our family over to do stuff with us and, and make a, a long extended trip next yeah. summer. Nice. Well, I want to say thank you so much for, for hopping on the, the show and, and talking. And I've learned so much about your business and you, and it's so exciting to hear what you're doing. And uh, thank you for your time. I very much appreciate it. Oh, no, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to capture uh, or to get in front of in your, your uh, yeah. of them? So Wendy with the Y at Content Bacon um, is my email and just do a search for me. I'm on all social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Insta. There can't be too many competitors. There's probably not a content sausage out there, but maybe there <laughs> is. I don't know. You probably look, but um, well, good. And thank you for our listeners. I uh, appreciate you tuning in and and my my producer always reminds me to ask you to to subscribe to the podcast uh, appreciate you listening and look forward to talking to you again in the future and that's a wrap there's another successful episode of the fractional c-suite retreat see our show notes and more episodes at fractional c-suite retreat.com this podcast is sponsored by your cmo helping organizations grow save time and money with better marketing strategy and fractional execution visit them at y o r cmo.com, yourcmo.com, spelled wrong on purpose.